We're going to move on now to our second speaker this morning, who is joining us online. So I would like to introduce you to Georges Alp, who uh, is born in Germany, a Jesuit who holds degrees in theology, philosophy and sociology. Um, has been working for 20 years with the Jesuit Refugee Service for the awareness of climate and environmental issues uh, since his time as a missionary priest in the Lion Mountains of Belize. He's involved in climate activism uh, since the start of the Fridays for Future movement and his friendship is with the activists of the last generation. Uh, presently, he is university chaplain and cooperator of the Jesuit Mission Office and the Jesuit Centre for the Social Ecological Transformation of Nuremberg. So, welcome to Georges. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can understand that we have famous for talking too fast, so especially I ask the athletes to come um, yeah, I will ask the three points in the presentation. First, how to have Second, what are ways to motivate the soldiers to do this particular feat? And third, what are the spiritual traditions related to the use of third generation that we did not have to fight climate change. <laughs> Klaus Fettröder told me, well, if you are angry, why are you screaming at me? Go to the Fridays for Future and talk to them, which I did. So the Fridays for Future explained to me the concept of tipping points, which so far I did not understand. Only 2019, I came to understood the seriousness of the tipping point system in the climate system. All these interconnected issues in the world climate system, which can influence each other. My favorite example is permafrost in Siberia. If permafrost is thawing, it is releasing methane, which is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. If this happens, climate is warming faster, the Arctic sea ice is melting, the Greenland ice sheet is melting, and the Atlantic circulation is slowing down. Example of four interrelated issues um, which could affect our life in Europe as we know it. At this time, I still thought, okay, it's more serious than I thought, but we still have time to deal with the issues. And this misconception of mine was destroyed by this young man. This is Henning. He was 20 years old when he started an unlimited hunger strike ahead of the 2021 uh, general elections in Germany. And Henning and six friends went into the hunger strike by asking the question, why is politics now for the general elections only talking about um, Corona, about uh, economy, about um, budget restraints, and not about the future of the young generation and um, the devastating consequences of climate change in the global south. 
and they were asking with the hunger strike uh, from the politicians to also put these issues on the agenda of that campaign uh, com campaigning and yeah this was very difficult i helped in the background to establish the links to the um, main representatives of the parties uh, the conservatives the green party and the social democrats and with limited uh, success because it was obvious that um, Olaf Scholz, the social democrat, was going to become chancellor, but he was the only one who did not reply to the request of these young people. And um, yeah. they were offer offering uh, private talks after the election, but um, Henning was insisting that this topic needs to be in the public. So on the left, you can see Henning at the beginning of his hunger strike, and on the right, after 28 days without food and eight hours without drinking on the intensive care unit of um, a Berlin hospital. Henning would have died if Olaf Scholz would not have relented and called him really five seconds ahead of Henning's death. This was really a tough moment. And um, yeah, ever since then, Henning and I are very good friends even though we disagree on a number of issues, for example, the question, how much time do we have to resolve the urgent uh, challenges of climate change? I still was saying, ah, okay, let's say 10, 15 years, and Henning was always insisting, no, we have not more than three years, and this is a really tight race. And yeah, I came to realize that Henning is okay. I was devastating for many years. Yes. So, so for me, for me the, the challenge was that I was working on these issues for decades and had quite a number of successes, like being receiving the Peace Nobel Prize in 1997 with a campaign to ban landmines, um, meeting with politicians every now and again, talk about these issues with no result um, in practical life, that I was receiving academic prizes of high reputation, which did not make uh, public and politicians to listen to my messages better. I was writing uh, 15 books on these issues. Nobody really gave a shit on it. So if you're working on these issues with conventional means uh, and nobody is listening, of course, there is a question, what can you do to make people listen, to make politics listen? And this was the point where I also decided to join um, civil resistance. And um, this um, image I took because it's not just young activists blocking roads in Germany and going into civil resistance. It's also scholars and scientists. This was a blockade which um, 10 scientists uh, did in um, Munich. Um, all these white coats are eminent scholars on climate change, on nutrition, on agriculture, on health. And I was taking part as a specialist on migration. So we were blocking the roads. We were giving lectures in front of a ministry in Munich. And we, yeah, we stopped traffic. We stopped daily routines for two hours before the police was cleaning. But again, we have the same kind of experience. Yeah? Politics is not listening. Public is not listening. Everybody is annoyed that we are disturbing routine. And the only consequence so far we have is that we are getting arrested and that we are getting to courts, that we receive guilty verdicts, and I'm facing eight weeks of prison time so far. Next Friday at this time, I have my next court uh, appointment, then probably more will be added to this. Yeah, of course, it is not popular to be um, in civil um, resistance, but um, I was pushed into these activities also by the African Jesuits, by Charlie Chilufia, who man, some might know of you. And when I told, told Charlie Chilufia for the first time that um, the last generation in Germany is blocking uh, roads, um, Charlie was um, yeah, very appealed by this. And um, at the first um, road blockade, he sent um, not only he, but uh, 
his uh, message of uh, solidarity was this one. We welcome and support the courageous actions of so many peop young people across Germany in support of climate justice. By their activist activities today, motorists have been interrupted. At the same time, the disruptions caused um, by these justified acts of civil disobedience pale in comparison to those caused by climate change. The young people in, on German roads today are standing up for us. Yeah, Charlie was also telling me that uh, what we are doing in Germany and the uh, UK and France and Switzerland and uh, Italy, I'm not sure about Spain, that this is an important contribution because we in the global north caused the problem and the global south is suffering. At the same time, the global south has no say in what we are doing in the global north to get um, the social ecological transformation ahead. Uh, so it is very important that we are advocates in our activities for the global south. And I'm really happy that for whatever I did in Germany, for all the blockades I participated, there were always solidarity addresses from Jesuits in the global south. And this, of course, gives me some sort of legitimation, which even if it does not impress public and politics and the judges, um, it gives me a peace of mind. Right, time for the second um, question, which was put at me, what are the main ecological and social issues and in that particular field? I use my protests as some sort of exclamation mark for the topics I normally deal with. I'm still a Jesuit, I'm still doing demonstrations, petitions, lectures, I'm still writing articles and books, but in certain situations, I'm also taking to the streets and um, yeah, emphasize uh, the content um, I'm dealing normally with. And the general topics of my work are still the violation of planetary boundaries of which climate change is just one. That we are living in an age of poly crisis. Uh, there is war, there is hunger, there is a lot of things of which climate change is just one. And the big problem I'm always encountering is that humanity, politics, public is failing to understand that there is a systemic cause of all these crises, namely neoliberal capitalism. The more specific topics among the Three broad ones are migration, the social ecological transformation, populism and the threat to democracy, taxation and justice between the rich and poor, exploitation of natural resources for the transformation and for the so-called green growth, practice and theory of social disobedience and resistance, and the social ethical reflection on all the before points. Now, the final point, what are the spiritual challenges related to the week of the spiritual exercises from the week I am speaking? Well, the challenges for climate activists, including me, in view of society at large, are the, the gap between applause for the general timely justified engagement and the total lack of political change. Yeah, we are, receiving, uh, we are receiving commendation for what we are doing, and each judge in my courts also say, well, Father, you are doing the right thing, I admire your courage, you really follow your moral compass, and still, yeah, I have to sentence you for what you are doing, because you are um, offending against the law. So, yeah, there is a gap, and this gap is not nice. Um, then the fact and the feelings of the futility and misunderstanding in what we attempt to do and to achieve. Uh, people are always, many people are getting angry that we are blocking roads for mothers bringing their children to the kindergarten, for workers trying to get to work. And the message which we have that our destruction of traffic is just a symbol of what is ahead when climate change strikes. 
like in the global south, where climate change is also a disruption of daily life, like floodings, landslides, um, power cuts, and whatever. So we are talking about traffic jams and um, these kind of things, and we are not talking about the issue which we would like to highlight. The next point, I mean, you can see the parallels to the um, passion of Christ. There's yeah? the overwhelming power of the opponents. Yeah? What Pilate right. and the high priest were for Jesus, the fossil fuel corporations are for us. Yeah? In the end, it is the fossil industry who still has a lot of power in the West and who is blocking um, the things which needs to be done. Yeah? And especially in Germany, the tabloid, which is most outspoken against whatever is done to resolve the climate crisis, um, belongs with 40% to KKR, which is the world's largest investor in fossil energies. Yeah. And of course, if a newspaper tabloid belongs to 40% to such an investor, of course, the newspaper is writing not in, um, in the sense of climate um, activists, but it's writing in the interests of um, uh, um, fossil corporations. Next point is that we realize the brute fact that whatever we are doing is too late and that we can't stop things from happening. Yeah. I mean... Again, the IPCC said in 2025, emissions have to go down. And we all know it's not going to happen. Yeah, what does this do with us? And I also realize among young people that eco-anxiety, burnout, depression is growing. And um, this also brings many people out of activism because they say, well, I now have to take care of myself and I can't. Uh, I'm losing my spirit of fighting against all these um, problems. What are the challenges for climate activists, including me personally? Yeah, the challenge is that um, we have emotional links to creation. And um, if we realize how creation is suffering under uh, climate change, of course, it also does something with you. And um, I'm also gardener in the Ukama Centrum in Nuremberg. And um, it always was hurting me in the last years when the summers were getting drier and drier. And I really had to share the little water I was collecting from rain with a few plants, which I tried to keep alive. And um, the same story I'm hearing from other activists uh, when they take their time off and make a walk in the forest, they don't see the green leaves. Huh? They see that the green leaves are having brown spots, uh, meaning that um, the forest is suffering and uh, the trees are going to die. So, of course, if you are aware of the problems, you discover these problems elsewhere, and this does something with your personal mood. And... As you can imagine, if you are doing things like this, you are receiving a lot of hate and resentment. Uh, both if you're sitting on the road and the uh, motor motorists come up to you and scream at you, or if you're receiving emails, if you are having posts of social media and people want to kill you for what you are doing. Um, yeah, if you are uh, a psychological stable person or you can you can file this away but uh, the activists um, are sensitive people and they're suffering a lot on this kind of hate and resentment um yeah then of course some people try to cheer you up and uh, say ah come on things are not so bad um, don't be a sissy um you are taking things too serious. Well, fucking hell, they are serious, yeah? And all these attempts to make you think they are not serious are mistaken, yeah? So these kinds of uh, cheering up attempts are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Then you realize if you are going into this kind of climate activist, this is dividing families and communities. And this is also something activists are suffering a lot, that... They follow their conscience, they're doing the right things, and their family and friends um, saying, oh, what you are doing is just um, hysteria. Yeah? Uh, try to get your sane senses back. 
So even the social context where you should be at home, where you should feel support, is fighting you and criticizing you. So you are losing social context and social support. Yeah? You are really very isolated, like Jesus, when all his disciples are running away. Um, you are left with very few who are still trying to support you in solidarity. And then there is a follow-up. Huh? Blockades and protests on the streets is still something cheerful and heroic. There is a lot going on. And um, yeah, even with the police, um, we have a good time. Um, I'm always more surprised. I always think that the police is a problem. No, not at all. Um, the police normally are young people, young family fathers. And whenever the police was arresting us after the activities, there are always some young policemen sneaking up to us and whispering in our ear, thank you for what you are doing. I have little children. I'm very grateful for what you are doing. And please don't be angry that I have to do my job right now by arresting you. So yeah, being with the police was all, is always nice. But the hate and aggression comes in with the public prosecutor because the public prosecutor is uh, executing the political line, which in Bavaria is very tough. And all these legal proceedings are out of the limelight. Yeah? And if you're sitting on the bench in the courtroom, you're really feeling very lonely because yeah, the excitement is gone and you are facing the consequences which are not really nice. And yeah, if you're getting a guilty verdict, which is in 99% the case, then of course there are many saying, well, if our wonderful... Uh, state is handing down a guilty verdict, maybe there is really something justified uh, that you are punished and uh, that you are being locked away eventually. So this, of course, also is not really good for your personal uh, confidence because these kind of um, critique also does something with your own position. Challenges for me as a Jesuit and pastor, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. very difficult to keep my own sense of life, uh, of hope alive. Uh, if you are really understanding science, if you're really understanding how serious the problems are, how, um, yeah, how speedy we are on the track to disaster, it's very difficult to believe that the change is possible. Of course, God could come down from heaven and take us from the cross, but my convi conviction is that uh, God is respecting human freedom, which is coupled with human responsibility. If human, um, if the human race in its um, freedom thinks thinks that this uh, what we are doing is what we want to do, then of course God is respecting what we are doing. If this leads to disaster, okay. It's our responsibility and he will not stop us. Yeah? I mean, there is always this argument by right-wing Catholics, oh, God was giving Noah the promise that he will not destroy the earth anymore. And um, if it comes um, a peak to show, yeah, God will interfere and protect us from what we are doing. No, I don't think this is going to happen because the problems we are suffering now are not God's problem. Yeah? The flood with Noah was God's problem. But the floods which are um, now on the earth are results of human, um, um, human activities. And if we are not getting the change, God will not resolve the problem for us. And yeah, we are on the road on disaster. And this is a very depressing thought. Yeah. And yeah. I still have this kind of spiritual hope that God is able to open doors and um, converting hearts and um, moving the powerful into the right direction. I have experiences in my life which make me stick to this conviction. Activists um, don't have this experience in this conviction. So, yeah, if I really try to keep my sense of hope alive, it's sometimes very difficult for me to yeah, keep this hope 
in a way alive that activists um, believe me that I still have this hope. <laughs> so I'm torn here between the rock and the hard place. On the one side, I'm in the danger of losing hope and still clinging to the little hope I have. And then I'm still in, in the responsibility as a pastor to also give this kind of hope to activists and to keep them going and um, not falling into eco-anxiety, burnout and depression. And of course, it's very difficult um, to bear the critique from Christian and right-wing Catholics who are thinking that I'm a bad priest by abandoning the good Catholic faith and following the eco-religion of young people. Yeah? I mean, there are quite a number of people also trying to get me removed from the priesthood for what I am doing. There was already a complaint in Rome about me. Um, well, I'm still thinking that um, what I'm doing is in accordance with the four universal apostolic preferences, that what I'm doing is in accordance with the prophets and Jesus. But um, yeah, there are quite a number of uh, people in the Catholic Church who think what I'm doing is the wrong way and this is it is destroying the church or yeah, distracting the church from the issues which are important for good Catholics. What gives strength? First of all, yeah, of course, there is also support, respect and admiration. But um, yeah, it is little in comparison to hate and resentment, which is much more. But of course, um, to know that uh, what I am doing is in the tradition of the prophets and Jesus' civil of Jesus' civil disobedience, um, this is um, yeah very important to me. And um, I'm always having this uh, favorite example that Jesus broke um, the command, the, the Sabbath, um, in if there was a human being in front of him. Um, Jesus could really have told him, come again tomorrow because the Sabbath is holy. But uh, for Jesus' engagement for the human well-being was even more important than um, the third commandment. So I'm always saying, if what I'm doing is um, an attempt to uh, mitigate suffering in this world, I think I'm in good company. Um, um, yeah, yeah, being a Jesuit. Part of the Society of Jesus, of course, there are also other Jesuits um, who did what I was doing. I mean, I met Daniel Berrigan, for example, at his 85th birthday, and I was impressed of this man. Um, in those days, I did not ever envisage, uh, envisage that I also might become one of this kind, but... Um, yeah, when Dan was arrested 250 times, I was arrested so far only 10, 10 times. times. So, so, yeah, there is still um, a way to go. Or Stan Swami. Yeah. I was doing a lot of advocacy to get Stan Swami released from prison when he was arrested on Maoist um, accusations. Um, uh, we were not um, we were not successful in getting him out of prison and he died in prison. So, yeah. Um, I think uh, doing this kind of civil resistance together with um, other activists is also something where I think I can follow a tradition uh, which yeah, people like Dan Berrigan and Stan Swami are standing in. Very important for me is the friendship with these young activists. As you can imagine, especially Henning has a very special place in my life. Um, since um, our joint history in the hunger strike. And uh, yeah, if you are in solidarity with these people and the good spirit, this is very important um, for me to carry on. It's the same with uh, poor people. I mean, I was doing project work in Africa, I was living with the Maya Indians in Belize. And uh, yeah. Whenever I have doubt whether I'm on the right track, it's also helpful for me to think about these people whom I met in Africa and in Belize who are suffering now already among um, from the climate crisis. And um, yeah, a little thing which is helping me, for example, is that um, I have always activists or 
other people who are close to me in this fight on my desktop. So whenever um, I turn on my computer or my laptop or my cell phone, the first I'm seeing are faces of people with whom I'm solidari in solidarity in this fight for climate justice. And um, if in doubt, this gives me direction again. Yeah, of course. Finally, prayer life. Um, yeah, my prayer life is very simple. I always try to reconnect myself with God in the morning. And I always try to think of all those situations in my meanwhile 63 years long life where I had the feeling that God was present and that God was doing good things even without my own doing. Yeah? Especially the campaign to ban landmines for which I was part of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. This campaign would not have received without God working on the other end of what we were trying to do as campaigners. Because in this case, God was moving the hearts of the negotiators, which in the end brought about the Ottawa Convention, which nowadays has been signed by 168 states. And this experience from this campaign um, gives me also hope that maybe what we are doing with a considerable sacrifice will also move the right people at the right time uh, so that whatever is um, ahead of us might not be as um, destructive as it looks right now. Yeah, I'm coming to the end. The passion of Christ, as, depicted, as depicted in the spiritual exercise, can be a good coping aid for climate activists. Whoever is in eco-activism experiences a lot of doubt, suffering, resentment, and loneliness. And if this can be linked with the passion and experience of Jesus, then there is, of course, access to a strong pool of resilience, consolation, and encouragement. The problem, of course, is that um, what I was talking to you, and I'm sure that you understood what I was trying to say, is Chinese to climate activists, because the Catholic Church and Catholic priests are of a very low esteem, at least in Germany. You know? Many young people left the church, and by leaving the church, of course, they're also losing our tradition, our language, our imagery. And um, if I'm saying that um, the third week experience and aligning with the faith of Jesus can be a help in coping with all this difficult situation we experience in our passion as climate activists, yeah, this is a language with which young people in Germany are no longer understanding. So again, as a Jesuit and as a priest in touch with these young people, of course, we have to do a lot of basic work. Um, we have to reinvent a different language um, to connect with the experience of young people, to inform their reflection on things and um, yeah, assisting them in ways which is oriented to their experience and their understanding rather than in trying to preach um, the good um, news of um, the Ignatian retreat to them. But my hope is that by joining young people in solidarity, um, trying to talk to them and to share their suffering, maybe in the end we also can open their eyes and awareness towards mm -hmm. the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, and thank you for your patience and your perseverance as well. I know I, I speak for everybody when I say uh, we are very glad we did not fail to hear uh, your very moving uh, testimony. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, I'm just going to invite us now just to take uh, one minute to absorb what we have heard 
and also then maybe to consider what question or uh, point we would like to put to Georges, uh, technology allowing. Thank you. And uh, now we open up for questions or comments. And uh, George, I, I trust this will work. Um, I'm speaking with in uh, in Spanish. Maybe you have to. Yep. I don't speak Spanish. Yeah. Can you hear the English translation, York? Yeah, but somebody should somebody should help him connect that. Can you hear me, York? Can you hear me, York? Uh, I think I think the technician is helping him. Let's see if he hears me. Can you hear me, York? This is the translator. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Female voice, yes? Yes. Good. It's fine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. My name is Carlos. I'm from Chile, and I live in the south of Chile with Mapuche indigenous communities there in the south of Chile. And I would like to ask you the following question. I think quite often the discernment between what's legal and what's legitimate is not a matter of white and black, but there are so many nuances in between, and it's not easy to discern those. Have you found yourself in this situation where you've had to discern from this uh, perspective what's legal and what's legitimate? Uh, when uh, you know, have you have you had to decide whether to be there to a company to join or not a movement where political action or or violent political action, let's say, like blocking a, a way, blocking a street, um, when that. That is um, how to say, he says, um, let me think of the word. It's, when this can actually be taken as sabotage, maybe sabotaging the industries and the, I'm thinking of the experiences that we have in the South, because you do have to do discernment quite oftentimes in those situations. Thank you. Okay. Um... First of all, what we are doing in Germany is not violent and is no sabotage. I have not yet participated in these kind of actions. There are other groups doing this. And um, we refuse to uh, accept that blocking a road is violence. Of course, the legal, the legal definition is very clear. It is violence. But in our understanding, uh, violence is um, a force executed towards people, to make people suffering. And this is not the case with uh, if you stop a car. Yeah? There's no violence and no suffering. It's just a time delay. Whereas we say that uh, uh, violence is um, the fossil industry following their profit and their business 
killing people in the global south because the link between this um, um, profitable business model and dying and death in the global south is uh, established. So, of course, this is legitimate and not legal, but uh, that's what we are arguing when there's the accusation that what we are doing is executing violence. Now, did I discern between the, the difference between the legal and the legitimate? Well, I mean, by definition, civil disobedience and civil resistance is illegal because, I mean, that's the whole point, that you break laws. Um, the point is, when do you enter in this activity? You enter into this activity, and this I tried to elaborate in my presentation, you enter into this activity if um, you have the feeling that whatever you can do in a legal way does not bring the desired results. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are different steps uh, which draw you into these activities. My first uh, breaking of the law was um, stealing food from containers in supermarkets. In Germany, we have every year 12 million tons of edible things thrown away because uh, yeah, we just have too, too much. And the first activity of my friends was this kind of stealing food and distributing edible things for free to just highlight the issues of food waste in the global north. And um, when they did this, of course, I realized that this is also a point which is important to Pope Francis, who also has posted news on Twitter, who organized symposia, who wrote about it. And again, I mean, the Pope can say what he wants. It doesn't change politics and practice. So um, this was the point that I said to my superiors, I want to participate in this theft because this is another way of symbolic um, activity to highlight the problem which we have, that the global north is living on the cost of the global south. So this was a very low level entry into breaking the laws. Yes, I was breaking the law of property, but even in Germany, I had the backing of our constitution, which says in one article that property has to serve the common good. So you have on the low level, you break a law, but even the constitution is legitimizing what you are doing. Um, which is maybe also the reason why the public prosecution against me was um, um, stopped, because the public prosecutor was seeing that my position is too good to be drawn to court. It's different with blocking roads and motorists, uh, but even here we think that there are stipulations in the positive law um, giving us right. But so far, uh, for, for example, that um, in the penal law, there is a clause in Germany saying that um, if you are committing, um, if you're breaking the law in order to protect people from previous harm, your breaking of the law is not um, a, a criminal. Mm. Yeah. So far, the judges refuse to accept this uh, stipulation of the law in our case. But we are pretty confident if we ever make it to the constitutional law in Germany, that this um, stipulation will have importance because whatever we are doing is trying to um, make our government respect international treaties, national law, and the verdicts of our constitutional court. Yeah? Our argument is our government is breaking the law and with our breaking of the law, we just protesting against the previous breaking of the law of the government. So you can see it's a very complex thing. And of course, we are spending a lot of thought of on what we are doing and why we are doing and how we can argue our case in front of politics, public and the courts. Fernando Lopez. This is Fernando Lopez from the traveling team from the Amazon. All dear brother. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for being so fucked up, but so happy, he says. <laughs> Thank you very much for being 
in love right to those crucified and those wounded where the wounds are so open and where lives are so threatened thank you very much for your testimony for being there uh, holding the cross with those crucified and with those that are deeply wounded and uh, god bless your mother who gave you life <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, this is heartening. But of course, I know that uh, speaking to you, I in a group of brothers <laughs> who share my sentiments. But this is a rare occasion and a rare pleasure, which I'm enjoying thoroughly. And I will tell my mother, who is still alive, um, what, of what you are telling me today. By the way, um, when um, my first my, my first legal prosecution was at court, I was asking my mother whether she would like to join me. She's in a wheelchair, she can't talk anymore, and <laughs> she was fervently in favor of um, accompanying me, but of course, um, the doctors in the end uh, prohibited her from coming. She's now 88, but um, yeah, my parents are still supporting me very much, as, do, uh, as does my community where I live, and yeah, so I'm in a quite privileged situation, quite different from many families of activists uh, I was talking in my presentation, who are much more divided on these issues. But of course, the wider province of Jesuits uh, I belong to, of course, also has people who are criticizing me and um, saying that I'm doing the wrong things. And I mean, they are justified because... There are quite a number of donors for our schools or university colleges who are saying if the Jesuits tolerate such an idiot in their ranks like this Father Alt, um, then they are no longer donating money to support our institutions, which of course is stupid because the work our university colleges and schools are doing is still as good as it was before stupid Father Alt took to the streets. And it's just a very stupid um, prejudice the, and excuse to stop financial support of the otherwise good work our Jesuits are doing in Germany. I'm a Jesuit from Lebanon. I was happily very touched by uh, the amazing uh, young people who are interested by this problem. Because I'm uh, I'm working uh, chaplain in the university, and the big problem is that the young people are not interested by anything. So, uh, and I think that uh, because you you said something, I find it uh, key to understand. If you are aware of the problem, you will see it. And I think they are not aware, of, uh, and they don't want to be aware of any problem, because they are aware that they will see the problems. So uh, I, I don't ask for a solution, but um, I, I find that the, the, the presence of these young men are really a, a strong sign of hope and of the work of God. Thank you. Yeah, but again, um, this big upsurge in engagement of young people, which was before the COVID crisis struck, yeah, has uh, dwindled to a trickle now because, um, yeah, COVID also in Germany did a lot of bad things to young people because they were isolated and were getting sick and um, are more interested now in their immediate well-being and no longer in fighting for a future, which is uh, years ahead. So, yeah, the pool of uh, possible recruits, recruits for this kind of civil disobedience and civil resistance has dwindled a lot. But um, another, another thing also which changed is that um, before COVID, it was uh, easier for young people and the public in general to trust scholarly predictions. Yeah? The reputation of the IPCC in Germany was um, immaculate before COVID struck, but uh, the COVID crisis in Germany um, gave the impression that um, yeah, scholarship is divided on many issues as far as dealing with the virus was concerned, 
and the pandemic, the handling of the pandemic is concerned, which of course is true. Yeah, this was an unprecedented event, and of course both uh, academics, research, and politics had to improvise to find their way back. It's different with the climate crisis, which is well researched for decades and where is a high unanimity. But um, the COVID experience gives all those people who do not want to listen to climate scholarship uh, a good excuse to say, ah, you know, in COVID, uh, it was very apparent that uh, academics and research is divided on issues. So, of course, also climate change is um, not really assured because there's a lot of doubt. And um, yeah, they're confusing the issue and they're confusing the people, both young and old. Yeah? So it's a very changed world where we try to push the issues now than it was before the COVID uh, crisis. Sí, buenos días. Mi nombre es Félix. Soy... Good morning. My name is Felix. I'm a Jesuit in Spain, in Valladolid. First and foremost, I am I'm so grateful for your testimonial and I feel moved and touched. And I wanted to ask you about civil institutional resistance. So Pope Francis in Laudato Si tells us that ecological conversion is also communal conversion. So I would like to ask you, uh, what's your take on this? Uh, Society of Jesus as an institution and other church institutions, how are they, how are we resisting from a civil yet institutional manner? Do you feel that the society helps you in your actions or maybe the society itself should play its own role uh, to, to be like prophets, to denounce and report more things, do more activities? Thank you. Yeah, of course, I would love to have more Jesuits besides me on the street, but I'm also aware that not everybody is um, uh, happy with this appeal. But um, I'm already very happy that what I'm doing out of my conscience is supported by Father Provincial. Uh, and uh, this also is not a matter of course, because it is so yeah, highly questioned in the public. So it's a really big comfort um, for me to know that Father Provincial is behind me. Ben, and yeah, I mean, this is quite something. So that in the Jesuits, I'm, I have a good backup. Now, um, other religious organizations like the Benedictines and Franciscan, Franciscans, uh, I was always trying to get them on board, but yeah, they are aging and uh, aging congregations have different problems from um, the climate change. Yeah? And um, as, far as far as the bishops are concerned, uh, there's every now and again, we had the Catholic convention two days ago, two weeks ago, um, every now and again, a bishop is sneaking up behind me and saying, ah, oh, Father, you are the prophetic face of the Catholic church. Well done, well done, but don't, expect me to say this in public. So yeah, it's a cowardice which I really deplore because um, research also tells us that an important contribution to achieve a social tipping point towards what needs to be done is that religious leaders speak out the truth about the situation. And in this article um, I'm referring to about the social tipping points, Pope Francis is given as a paramount example of clarity of speaking out the truth to power. Now, if the Catholic bishops in Germany would say exactly the same things as we activists do, this would really make a difference in um, the public debate. Yeah, They don't need to clue themselves to the streets. They don't need to be arrested. Just a pastoral letter about the fossil industry and the damage the fossil industry is doing to the world. Um, yeah, But this seems to be impossible uh, to hope for these kind of things. So it's again left to us. And yeah, institutional resistance from other groups is similar. The, the Lutheran church is similar restraint, but this also I guess 
has to do because in Germany, state and churches are very closely intertwined, interlinked because of the church tax. Um, we are simply too rich to um, afford the truth. Maybe this is easier in other state, other countries. Hello, George. Uh, my name is Trevor Scott. I'm a Jesuit uh, from Canada. And my question to you is, it, and may, maybe you have um, experienced this, but if you're spiritually directing someone who is discerning whether to take part in dis civil disobedience uh, for action, climate action, how would you help them to discern that decision? And I ask that because I believe that civil disobedience has a place in our society. But what if someone is coming to us to help them discern to take part in civil disobedience on a subject that we personally do not find, um, well, we don't politically agree with. And an example of this is in Canada a couple of years ago, and you may have heard of this, with the trucker protests against the vaccine uh, mandates that overtook Ottawa and that resulted in legal proceedings. I personally found that very difficult, but yet at the same time, I do believe in civil disobedience. And so how do we as a spiritual company, um, well, just, um, directors, help people to discern, even if they're asking to take part in civil disobedience against climate, policies, which is what we're seeing in Canada. We see these protests of people on the right who are against uh, uh, governmental action on behalf of climate change. So how do we as spiritual directors, accompaniers, help young people or anyone to discern when civil disobedience is a wise, legitimate, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I understood everything in your question because uh, the technical transmission was not really good. But how do we help young people to discern the, to do the right thing and not the wrong thing? Um, well, first of all, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not really counseling directly activists uh, because this is being done in their own circles. I'm rather in touch with uh, governing circles of the last generations and um, assisting or cooperating with them in de developing a general strategy and um, the, st the, the general uh, program of the movement. And um, yeah. I only know that all the activists I'm cooperating with re refuse Use violent, violent, violent. And when we realize that our um, activities um, increase in stabilization Germany because the uh, street blockades, bonds, the right, the right, the right wing extremists, um, we change, change the strategy, strategy into. Yeah, yeah, more, more messages, messages to the evildoers, like, like for the industry, industry or the super wealthy, and, and activities, activities which are all clearly clear, visible, visible, covered by our, our constitution, constitution, to um, keep, keep a high degree, high degree of, of legitimacy. legitimacy. And, and a third, third strand of activities which we developed was um, a program which is able to heal polarization in our society, um, like bringing together populists and activists and by um, or it, um, in, initiating conversation between those uh, opposed groups um, to increase understanding and defuse tension in our society. Of course, there is also violent um, protest in Germany, what the truckers were in Canada, the farmers are in Germany. And um, it was really funny that the, the farmers in Germany were extremely violent. They, they really were in danger 
endangering people by um, putting dirt on motorways or blockades on motorways, but um, the outcry in public and the prosecution by the authorities was much more reduced than it is against our peaceful protest. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes things are really strange. Um, yeah, it's not really what you asked me because, again, I'm not really involved or part of the last generations. I'm only involved on the leadership level of the last generation, but um, the last generation itself has a very tough training program for potential activists. So if you really want to join the last generation, you have to undergo a training. You are closely scrutinized whether you are a psychological stable person and only if uh, the last generation is satisfied that you really remain peaceful under stress and under pressure, then you're permitted uh, to the activ activist groups. If, if the last generation is not sure that you are keeping your discipline, then you are not permitted into activities because yeah, the last generation has all interests that no activist is losing its discipline. And for example, if they are hit by motorists, they're hitting back. Yeah? Uh, they really um, try to have only people on the street who, if they are being hit by motorists, just um, accept the blow and hope that police will come or other bystanders will try to restrain the furious people um, which, yeah, always exist. But, um, yeah, the whole program of Last Generation is uh, geared up to defuse tension and to keep its discipline and to be without violence. Thank you, George. I know we could continue for much, much longer, um, but that also feels like a very good image, actually, now we're considering the third week to maybe draw um, our considerations for this part of the morning to a close. Um, but I know that everybody here would like to join me in thanking you very much uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Well, you still have Fabian with you, so he also is quite knowledgeable about these things. So if you have further questions, just go to Fabian, and he certainly is also happy to help. Thank you. And I think we should also say thank you very much to everyone dealing with the technical side of the morning. You've been very here. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. I wish you a good conclusion of your conference and thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Okay. I think now it's time for coffee. And we have half an hour. So back here at 11.45. Thank you. <laughs>